Hello and welcome to what I hope is the first of a semi-irregular series on a science book club where I get science friends to recommend sci-fi or science books that they find particularly inspiring or that have helped them learn about science and be inspired by science. With me today to kick this off is Toby from ANU. Uh, Toby has her own YouTube channel, which is much, much bigger and better than mine. I'll put a link in the description, go check her out, though if you follow me, you probably already know about Toby. <laughs> so Toby, what have you got for me today? All right, well, thanks for inviting me to the first of your book club series. I today have a uh, book called Electric Dreams by Philip K. Dick, and it's actually a collection of his short stories, and they're sci-fi stories. Um, so, so, sorry, Philip K. Dick is um, Electric Sheep, right? Yes, so he famously wrote Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, which is another short story, and it became the movie's Blade Runner. So Blade uh, Runner is based on that story. So is that one in there? Uh, no, oh, okay. <laughs> these are different stories. I don't think that one's in there, at least not from my memory. <laughs> um, that's one I, I had read earlier, and that dealt with, like, you know, what is a human, what is an android, that sort of thing. Um, the stories in here actually have also been adapted for film or TV. They've been made into a TV series, I think, on Amazon TV, if they make shows now. But I haven't seen those adaptations. I've only read the stories. Um, the reason I like these stories is because they all deal with the questions of, like, kind of what does it mean to be human? What is, how do we deal with new technologies like virtual reality? Um, I guess androids becoming more accepted and smarter and all these sorts of AI and technology type questions. So does it lean more towards hard sci-fi or sort of softer sci-fi but a social exploration? I think it's more probably on the themes of, socials, of social stuff because it's not like, there's no really hard calculations that I, I've particularly noticed or followed, it's more like uh, we have this technology available to us. What are the human implications? Like, how would this affect society? How would this affect the individual? Yeah. So. So, are there any particular stories you recommend from that one? Yeah. So, I, I, when you asked me to come and talk about it, I thought of three stories from here that I particularly liked and remembered. Um, they're on my notes. <laughs> Number one was the story called Exhibit Piece. Now, this was about. It's virtual reality in a way, but it was about getting lost in virtual reality. So it was about a guy who who sort of makes an exhibit, which is like a, a version of, of um, it's like a history museum. He makes an exhibit, which is like what the world looked like X many years ago. And he gets so involved in this exhibit that he sort of enters into it and no longer knows what is true reality and what's virtual reality. And I, I guess to him, there is no reality and like virtual reality there's just two different realities it was like two ways of existing so it was an interesting take on what's real interesting um, so uh, are these stories sort of uh, or, or are they split between sort of action paced or are they more slow and considerate i found them reasonably slow um so there's no no one's really getting shot by lasers and things like that <laughs> it's it's more like well, in this particular story, um, you just work through the psychology of this guy as he enters virtual reality and how he comes to terms with that. Right. Okay. Mm. So what else? Um, what so, what okay. about the other stories? Second story, Impossible Planet. So... Um, I think I know that name. Maybe? Well, I don't know. It's probably been adapted into something. Yes. Um, it's a reasonably very short story. And it's where, uh, I don't know, these two pilots or I don't know what to call them they have a spaceship and they take advantage of this old lady who really wants to travel to earth um, and they take advantage of her by saying well yeah sure we'll take you to earth even though they are under the belief that earth doesn't exist anymore and they take her money anyway and just take her somewhere else it's, it's sort of um, you think that the lady the old lady is being fooled but in the end someone else is being fooled um, I don't want to spoil it but the story actually deals with, I guess, the human fear that Earth is doomed, like our our future on Earth is doomed, that we're going to have this future out in the solar system or out on another planet somewhere because Earth is never going to last, and it deals with that. 
So are these the kind of stories you can sort of relax and read before bed, or do you want to sort of be in a more awake um, frame of mind to get the most I out mean, of I mean, you stories? can relax and read it before bed as long as you like a little bit of depressing existential crisis on I love existential crisis Earth right before I go to try to get to sleep. And the future of humanity. <laughs> If you're like, yeah, you want to have some dreams about existential crises. I never sleep better than when I'm having an existential crisis. Okay. (laughs) Sounds great. I want to read it, but I don't think I'll be reading it before bed. Yeah. um, Okay. So the third story in here was one called Human Is. I think that's what it's called. And and it deals with what it means to be human. um, And I think like any good sci-fi, it deals with the nature of love itself. (laughs) And it says like, um, I, I guess... The theme is um, what makes a human human is love. What makes someone human? Um, Because is that a uniquely human quality? Who knows? I think sci-fi authors like to to have that as one typical human quality, but I don't know. I think that's what that story was about. Sounds good. I'll be looking into getting that book. It sounds good. (laughs) It's got a nice cover. (laughs) It does. Mine doesn't have a nice cover, mainly because I've recently moved to this city and I don't have my original copy with me, so I've grabbed this out of the library just <laughs> over there. Um, what is so it? So to, to offset the uh, sci-fi, I'm going with non-fiction. So this is Wrinkles in Time by George Smoot. Mm. Uh, this, uh, this book is one of my favourites. It solidified for me the idea that I wanted to do a PhD. So George Smoot was leader of the Kobe mission. The Kobe mission was a satellite that went up in the early 90s to map the cosmic microwave background. The cosmic microwave background is the afterglow of the Big Bang. And one problem with the Big Bang theory was that it said that all matter in the universe should be evenly uniform. Well, if it's evenly uniform, then how can galaxies and stars and things form after the Big Bang? So there must have been small, what we call anisotropies, basically wrinkles, over-densities and under-densities in the Big Bang. And they result from quantum fluctuations in the atom-sized universe when it was just starting to explode, when the Big Bang was just starting. So these tiny quantum fluctuations have been blown up to enormous scales. They're now across the sky, and they can be seen as slightly hotter and slightly colder patches by one hundred thousandth of a degree hotter or colder across the sky and so that was a prediction those little tiny variations in temperature actually gave us everything we have today is that right yeah because they were the that small starting big impact it's not so much the temperature it's that there was an over density of matter Mm, at a particular point that then had slightly more gravity and so attracted everything around it and so a galaxy cluster formed around that over density Mm. But that over density then causes a temperature change due, due to its greater gravity, causes a, an apparent temperature change in that background radiation that the universe is full of. Um, so this was a prediction in physics that mm. in order to sort of confirm the Big Bang theory and move forward with the Big Bang theory had to be found. And George Smoot was the guy with Kobe, was the leader of the team who did it. It was a huge team, so it wasn't just George Smoot. But this book was written off the back of the success of the Kobe mission. And the reason I love it is because the first quarter of the book is a very good popular science book about cosmology and about Big Bang physics up to where George Smoot started working in the field. Mm. So before then, it's like reading um, Marcus Chown or something like that, (laughs) where you've got someone who's an outsider but writing a very good description, a very a very good um, story about the state of physics up to a certain point. So it's a very good popular science book up to there. Then for me it gets brilliant because once you get into George Smoot's own work it becomes fascinating because uh, along with Key Davidson or Kay Davidson, I'm not sure how you pronounce <laughs> it, there's the guy, the science journalist who helped George Smoot write this book you start to really feel the um, the how the experiment is going. Uh, so George Smoot launched experiments on balloons, put experiments in high-flying aircraft, mm. and eventually the Kobe mission as a satellite. So what were they trying to do? They were measuring cosmic microwave background. Is yeah. that what they're doing? Yes. So are, are these 
or are they not the people who measured the pigeon droppings in a dish and thought D- that was the guy. microwave? <laughs> so that's in the first quarter of the book, the pigeon droppings. Okay. Um, no, th- this is after that. Uh, this is year, This is uh, four, 30 years later. Okay. So 30 years after, so yeah, the pigeon droppings was, we've got the, oh, that was we've to got find out the it was cosmic microwave background. Mm, now we're measuring it. Now we need to find the tiny inconsistencies in it. Okay. So, but as George Smoot is doing his uh, experiments, you really feel the tedium of the data analysis, the anxiety of mm. having this thing work, because he's sending millions of dollars of equipment up on a plane or up on a balloon, it could get damaged, or launching it on a rocket that could explode. You really feel the anxiety and the worry, and then the tedium of the data analysis, and then the elation of the discovery. Mm. And so, you, I really felt excited reading this book. and You're that, reading about all the tedium and anxiety, and you're like, that's for me. <laughs> but, yes. No, it's the elation at the end that it was all worth it. Yeah. All of that difficulty was worth it because you had discovered this new thing about the universe, and that elation resonated with me and was what finally solidified the idea for me. I was already considering doing a PhD, mm. But this convinced me, yes, I want to do a PhD in experimental physics mm. because I want this sort of life and this sort of experiences. Yeah. I mean, he, he got to go to the South Pole to map the galaxy in order to subtract the radiation of the galaxy from the cosmic microwave background. He talks about nearly dying at the South Pole just because he started breathing too heavily because it starts to freeze <laughs> your lungs. Uh, yeah, I guess you don't typically think of cosmology as as a career as being something adventurous or you'd get to travel and do random things like this. It, definitely, it definitely showed that science can be an adventure, mm-hmm. that you do interesting things, go to interesting places. It was, it's a really exciting book. It's one of my favorites of all time. I highly, highly recommend anyone interested in physics or cosmology or considering doing a PhD, read this book. <laughs> But don't stop before you get to the elation part. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't don't think the tedium is no good. I can't, I can't, this isn't for me. Mm. All right, that sounds like a good recommendation. And I really love the title, Wrinkles in Time. It just it's, sounds so it's nice. Good. <laughs> it's also got some nice diagrams. It show. Ooh. <laughs> it does have a few pictures. It's mostly not pictures, but it does show uh, explain how the satellite worked, how the instruments worked. Mm. There's some weird bits, like apparently the satellite exploded, but didn't stop working. So, so, um, the US Air Force were tracking the satellite on radar and bits came off it, but all of the telemetry, all of the data was still good. No, the power systems didn't change, thermal systems didn't change. They couldn't find anything wrong with the satellite, but 64 chunks of satellite <laughs> fell off. Sounds that's still a mystery. <laughs> that's still a mystery. No one knows mm. what caused that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thanks for that. <laughs> So, Toby, thank you very much for joining me on what I hope is the first of a series of these. So, hopefully in future I'll have more physicists and other scientists recommending sci-fi and science books that have inspired them either in their research or just in general to get excited about science.